our lives. That is real leadership. I'll wait just a moment while everybody mutes. Begin now with me by closing your eyes. Once you've taken that note, it's such an important note. One of the keys, one of the actual facets of the realest form of leadership is fearlessly inviting those around you to be more successful in their lives, okay? Begin by closing your eyes and consider the last time somebody was generous with you. The last time somebody was generous with you. Could have been recently, it could have been another day. Could have been a few years back. And as you bring that back to your present moment awareness, feel the sensations in your body of remembering that generosity and how it played out within you. If I take the most recent example, I have Katie citing my mentorship as one of the catalysts for this project. And the feeling that I had was a little bit surprised and delighted and a healing happened in my body when she said that, a true healing. That is a place of greater safety within you. And it is from that place of greater safety that you can invite other people to fearlessly succeed. This is a place within you where transformation and trial and tribulation can all be met in the same way with courage, with dignity, with generosity. And living from this place of greater safety within you, you will be able to honor and celebrate everyone else's successes around you as your own. And one of the hugest mistakes I see made in this community is when folks consider themselves in any form of competition with other teachers. We are not in competition. We never have been. We never will be. We are all born with the same heart and completely different forms of delivery. And there are so many people that desperately need what we have. What if we were to make the giving of this feeling of harmony, of generosity, of delight, possibly even surprise. What if we were to make giving that feeling a consistent practice? What if just as regularly as you get on your yoga mat, mine is right behind me, just as regularly as you brush or floss your teeth, I hope you're flossing, it really does matter. What if as regularly as you engaged in whatever it is that you do creatively, what if you made catalyzing other people's, other people's success a part of your practice? And I ask you to write down in what part of your day would this fall in? When would you possibly consider making this a consistent practice? Is it maybe in your Instagram comments that you make it a, a conscious effort to root for other people? Is it in the work that you do outside of your yoga teaching? Is it in your yoga teaching itself? I dare you to consider what this would feel like to to go past what feels comfortable and safe for you. And from this place of capital G, greater capital S safety, you stand for everyone else's success. We do this by attending and attending, I'm referencing the word attention. We do this by really observing what is going on around us. Are these folks whom we've mentored? Is this somebody with whom we feel ourselves in competition? Is this somebody who has 
perhaps denigrated us in the past. How do I make rooting for her a consistent practice when she has socially shamed me or uh, bullied me in some way? How do I make that a part of my practice? This is going so far beyond what you think is actually necessary for the health of your business, for the health of your teaching, for the health of your bottom line and going into really the nether realms, the realms that we don't really think about as a, as a consistent form of practice. I will interrupt this by saying that one of my teachers is Seth Godin and according to him, business models rework the world. Originally, business models were primarily about needs. You need food, I create a farm. You need shelter, I build houses. But as parts of the world have gotten more and more wealthy, the money that's spent, which is what business models, of course, are based on, has shifted largely from needs to wants. So this one millionaire buying collectible cars spends far more than 100 families buying beans or lettuce. Marvel spent $400 million to make the last Avengers movie because there was a business model in place that made it a reasonable investment choice. Promise, promise I'm getting somewhere. What if we wanted to cure bullying or address ineffective policing as much as we wanted to watch movies? The business model would shift and things would change. And I'm not sure that there's an intrinsic reason that watching a particular movie is more satisfying than solving an endemic problem, but we've evolved our culture, hear me here, focused on the business of amusement instead of the journey toward better. And if you are sitting here in this talk right now and you are a teacher of any healing modality or, an, or a proprietor of any healing modality whatsoever, you are moving the needle towards generosity, diversity, equity, inclusion. Let's define generous. Generous showing a readiness this is the dictionary here, showing a readiness to give more of something, money, time, resources, than is strictly necessary or expected. Okay, so we opened this talk for those of you that came a little bit after, suggesting that this generosity be directed toward a consistent practice of rooting and standing for and helping along other people's success that that is a definition of true leadership. This involves all aspects of your experience. It's how you teach, it's what you teach, it's what you say when you're not teaching. It's how you act on the medium that is right now, which is social media. How do you, what's there for you? And, and is, your, is your feed your sort of vision board or is it some way that you can denigrate other people? Where and in what context can you begin to help other people feel heard, seen, not judged and held? And then you get to call yourself a leader. And we have to begin with the most annoying, sometimes the most difficult and also the closest. We have to begin with ourselves. Your generosity, your consistent practice of rooting for someone else's success has to begin with yourself. Are you leading yourself? 
in this direction? Are you being generous with yourself? Do you have at, at a moment's notice the capacity to give yourself empathy? Go ahead, place your hand on your heart, give yourself empathy right now. Whatever is happening for you, place your hand on your heart and offer yourself a little bit of empathy, maybe a lot. And just feel that feeling for a moment. This morning, I had the great honor of interviewing Dr. Edith Eager, E-G-E-R, for what was the longest podcast interview I've ever done. She is one of the last living survivors of Auschwitz. And the way that she gives herself generosity of energy, of attention, of time, of learning, of development. This provides crucial vitality to the work that she does. She is 93 years young. She is still in private practice. She helps families, veterans, victims of all kinds realize that they are not actually anything more than the words that they use to label themselves today. You are not actually anything more than the word you use to label yourself today. Call yourself a leader and then lead with the most magnanimity you can muster every single day. You will never lose sleep in this way. Your generosity with your learning and your development and congratulations on being here for this very rich conference provides you with that crucial vitality to grow your offerings, to do what Katie's done, to gather the people that mean the most to her and create space for people to learn with them. What a beautiful thing. Where, I'd like you to answer this question for yourself on a piece of paper, where does generosity play into the work that you're doing now? Just a few notes. It doesn't have to be anything extensive or grammatically perfect. Where does generosity play into the work that you're doing right now? Where does generosity play in with colleagues who do similar work to you? Okay. I am not looking at the chat just so you know. So we will address the chat afterwards. And I think it's important for you to just keep your hands on your pen and your journal and write like crazy. Okay. With the colleagues that you know, who exhibit, who are an example of generosity, what do they do that lights you up, that truly inspires you? In these few notes, you'll have a lot of fodder for the end of this talk and for what you'll do going forward. So I'll give you another 30 seconds. There are four practices that I wanna focus on today. In case this all feels nebulous to you, which I would imagine that it might. The first is clear communication. So for example, I teach this all the time. Redundancy is completely called for with this following teaching. With your partner, with your dear friends and with your children, can you, or your parents, if your parents are living with you, parent or parents, at the end of each day, can you ask them what you could have done better? The best information of all time. That's the best example of clear communication that I can think of. Asking for feedback and receiving it lovingly with empathy for yourself. That's the first. And we're gonna do some detail on each one of these. The second, inviting leadership. We've talked about that quite a bit already. 
How do you welcome other people into their up leveling? The third, conveying a broader vision. That's, and that, that's anywhere, your work, your family, your yoga class, when your students come in, are you able to convey the broader, broader vision of what you want to accomplish? And fourth, connectivity. It's sort of the umbrella over all of them, but also its own. Communication, let's go into a little more detail on that. Are you transmitting what you're learning? So Katie takes in information, you know, within a couple of months, she turns it around and makes it into a conference. I'm not saying you need to rush at all. I'm giving you an example. Are you relaying what's helping you grow? This is exactly what she's done, both as a person and as a professional in your work, whatever it is that you do teacher or otherwise, are you able to create these little uh, inflection points for people to grow without you having to be there? Katie's done a great job of that here. This doesn't depend on her presence, although technologically it certainly does, but she's giving you access to what inspires her. How will you do that? for the people whom you serve. Are you sharing information spaciously? What does that even mean to you? Not in a way that wears you out, not in a way that wears anyone else out, but in a way, once again, that you invite others towards their own leadership and success. It's a level of empowerment and that's true generosity. And that segues beautifully into inviting leadership, generating growth. There is an element of how you teach that can be that invitation all the time. It might be in the way that you word your instruction on the mat. Can you feel the difference between your right foot and your left foot right now? Can you sense the breadth of your right collarbone versus your left collarbone. Can you sense which lung is more present? These are all just exam like fun top of mind examples of how you can invite people into their own observation, their own growth process. And I don't know why this has come up so present for me in the last year, but I'm always thinking about how this would happen if I was to disappear and or die. Would the kid be all right? Would the team be all right? Would the students? Of course they would. Don't be silly. But could I possibly make sure that I'm leaving behind the information that I'm learning in a way that would benefit my people. That's also inviting leadership. Some of the other things that I have learned that I do well in this realm, I have a great practice of introducing people to one another so they can just get on with it without me. I have a great practice of introducing people to their own highest capacities so they can just get on with it without me. I have a great practice taking time to consider how two people, three people, a team of people, a crew of people would fit together if I disappeared. This elevates everybody. It elevates everybody. And this is the culture of generosity. It's a culture of spaciousness. Okay, thirdly, and getting close to the end now, conveying a broader vision. What does that actually mean? I gave you the example of, of course, you know, if you've got students in a yoga class or a meditation practice and you indicate to them what your broader vision is for that 
window of time in which you're sharing space. Cool, great. Go bigger. Are you connected to your own broader future vision? Now, I don't, I don't like to get obsessed with this. Five years from now, I'm going to be living in Mer and building this house. Yes and no. You know, there's a lot of value to, to planning your future. And there's also a lot of value just for having the broadest vision possible. I see myself frolicking on the beach with my grandchild. My kid's only 14, so it's a little far away. But still, oh my God, the thought of having a grandchild. Are you able to leave, this is an important question, are you able to leave the, the toxicity of fragmentation at the wayside? It's kind of the biggest pickle the world is in right now. The way we began this talk and where we're at right this second matches like two perfect little puzzle pieces. How do I invite and incite success for other people? And how do I make sure that no toxic fragmentation seeps in? That is not what I want to empower. And it is happening in every community, including this one. Are you engaged? And this is important. This one, very, very important. Almost as important as releasing toxic fragmentation. Are you engaged in a chosen, with a chosen cause through your work? My dream in engaging with a few of the different businesses that I have now was to be able to freely give. Like that was top three of my dreams that I had. When you engage with a chosen cause, even if you have $1 to give a month, your work takes on a different meaning. And that broader vision becomes something entirely different. It's your, everything that you do is lit up by that, that fire. And you know where that percentage of that money is going. And it is downright exalted to think about it. Let that be a part of your fundamental foundational principles. There is a chosen cause, even if you give $1 a month to that cause but you're not just earning for yourself or your family anymore. This creates a very cohesive culture and it keeps everybody connected to this broader vision of yours. Super vital and vitalizing. The fourth point that I wanted to elaborate, elucidate is connectivity. How do you, and I'm in a year long socially engaged Buddhist training right now, and I'm learning how not to pretend that I'm listening, but to actually just listen. And not to, not to close my heart when somebody is saying something I don't like, with which I do not agree. Mm, 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 video off. I am learning that this connectivity of just allowing things to land, not necessarily agreeing, but helping folks to express themselves freely without insinuating my opinion upon the scene is a part of this connectivity. It's a part of this culture of generosity and it's a part of empowerment that becomes your leadership. Richard Freeman in The Mirror of Yoga, I've referenced this before, he talks about ahimsa as not shutting anyone out of your life, 
you don't have to have dinner with them, but, but you don't, that, that closed door is damaging to all. It's the opposite of this connectivity. I'm willing to work and talk to people with whom I don't agree because I think it's important for the whole world. I think those little points of contact change the way the flow is happening the world over. So one of my final inquiries for you today, with regards to the concept of generosity, what will be your legacy? What will be the way in which you come through in five, 10 years after your death? How will you be remembered? It's an interesting thought because it really does point to the quality of your leadership. Whether you were in fact creating a culture of generosity that didn't just involve you giving you know, a few bucks, but in fact involved you spinning a web of leadership throughout your space. Did you practice clear communication? And I'm, I'm really referencing your legacy post-mortem. Did you invite leadership? Did you convey your broader vision? Did you all, you, did you do all you could do to create community? Did you give people the time of day? Did you trust in yourself? Did you trust in the flow of what you did? And were you on both the giving and the receiving end of generosity? That's also leadership. To kind of put a bow on this and I, I'm super keen to take questions. It's never how much you know about something. It is always how much are you willing to share of what you've learned? How much are you willing to leave a trace of your purpose, your thoughtfulness on the things that you offer and do? I have a poem to close. I think it's perfect for right now. And it has little traces of all the things that we spoke about. It was sent to me today by a dear friend. And I thought, wow, God really does work in the most magical ways and delivers exactly what's needed. This is by Marge Piercy. This is the blessing for a victory. Although I shall not forget that things work in increments and epicycles and sometimes leaps that half the time fall back down. Let's not relinquish dancing while music fits into our hips and bounces our heels. We must never forget pleasure is real as pain. But the discipline of blessings is to taste each moment, the bitter, the sour, the sweet, the salty, and be glad for what does not hurt. The art, and I think this is the art of leadership, the art is in compressing attention to each little and big blossom of the tree. To let the tongue sing each fruit, its savor, its aroma, its use. Attention is love. What we must give children, mothers, fathers, pets, our friends, the news, the woes of others, what we want to change, we curse and then pick up a tool. Bless whatever you can with eyes and hands and tongue. And if you can't bless it, get ready to make it new. I think probably the most important aspect of this is that whatever you do, whatever you design, 
whatever course you teach, class you teach, whatever you deliver to your child, your parent, you are always inviting their greatness, particularly your partner. You're inviting their greatness. This is the mark of a true leader. I've thought about this for, for weeks. This is the mark of a true leader. So thank you for, thank you for attending, paying attention. I would love to welcome any of your questions if you have them. I will now go into the chat and attend to that. Let's see what we've got. Chat. Okay. Let's see, close that. And there we are. Could you please type the sentence or expression about generosity you said at the beginning? Of course. One of the key, it's actually in the description of this talk. I really like to make sure, by the way, if you're a teacher, one thing, make sure that you look at the description of the talk that you're going to give before you give it or the class that you're going to teach before you teach it, okay? Because there's usually some real good wisdom in there. You wrote it. One of the keys to real leadership is fearlessly inviting those around you to be more successful in their lives. to view their success as your success and your success as theirs. It's one of the main tenets of the most potent yoga philosophy there ever was. Being happy for somebody else's success. And you really do sleep well. Wonderful. I appreciate, um, Katie, the notes that you were taking. How lovely. Any questions? While well, you have me, I'm here. Please don't hesitate. Elena, I have a question, if I may. Please. Um, you said a definition of ahimsa is not shutting anyone out of your life. I think you said it came from Richard Friedman. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in that because mm. I feel that for many of us, part of reclaiming ourselves when we've been in very difficult relationships or maybe difficult childhood or whatever it might be, is mm -hmm. to have boundaries around the people who are toxic in our lives or who who don't don't serve a higher aspiration. Yeah. If you could speak to that a little bit, it would be helpful. I have one example. I have an uncle who upon the death of my mother, this is one of her brothers, the only living one, um, we learned that she had lent him a, a, a pretty exorbitant sum of money. There was the IOU right in her file and we presented that to him and he completely bailed, like just denied it, called us crazy. Like we're not, I promise we're not crazy. And we just thought, hey, you know, we're just cleaning everything up here. <laughs> like what happened to that? For about a year, I would say, I had this like jail door in front of my heart to him. I was like, there is no way I will ever communicate with that person again. What a disgusting display. Judge, 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 judge. Words, caustic words, caustic feelings, caustic energy in my body, caustic. I reread that chapter because I was going to interview Richard and Mary. And what I discovered is that I owe this man a, an email. And all I did was send an email and I said, you are hereby absolved of my anger and whatever you needed to do, you've done obviously. And I'm done being mad at you. If you'd ever like to be in communication, I'll be here. 
free. I'm free. I am free. I, in keeping him a prisoner, became a prisoner myself. I became a jailer, also going to work in a jail every day. Every time I thought about it. Man. And I'm not saying that boundaries aren't good. I have no intent of having breaking bread or doing anything further with this person. I think he really failed his sister and that's his business. That's his business with his maker. <laughs> but I do know that I am no longer willing to harbor a grudge in my person and in my heart. Again, it's in The Mirror of Yoga by Richard Freeman. Really excellent uh, talk and chapter. And while I super, super honor that boundaries are very important, and in certain cases, you guys, I am well aware of the trauma that you have endured. And there is no reason to be in touch with the perpetrator. There is no, absolutely no reason but there might be space in your body for a letter that you never send, forgiving. Dr. Edith Eager, she went to, she went back to um, Berlin. She had to give a talk many years after she was obviously liberated from Auschwitz by barely. She was rescued from a pile of corpses. She wouldn't have been rescued had her sister not had an unopenable can of sardines that caught the sun and caught the eye of one of the American soldiers who liberated the camp in 1945. She went back and she went back to Hitler's, the ruins of Hitler's house. She went back to the scene of her mother's death upon the arrival in Auschwitz. Her mother went sent straight to the gas chamber because the, the, the guard asked her, is that your mother or your sister? And she said, mother, she didn't know. She said, mother, the mother instantly got put into the line for the, for the gas chamber. I tell you this because Edith went back to this place and not only did she forgive Dr. Joseph Mengele, not only did she forgive Goebbels and Hitler, she forgave herself for being the person who said mother instead of sister causing her mother's death. Forgiveness is so important for our health and longevity. And if we can practice forgiveness, even Katie, within those incredibly clear, strict even boundaries, we have the balance. And I think that's where that has to live. Daniela is asking me a question. Knowing that you combine essential oils into your yoga, how do you combine health and beauty products or even technologies into yoga philosophy for women? Frankly, I only, I only teach and share exactly what I use myself. People send me things all the time. I will only share the stuff that I will use myself. And how I incorporate it into my yoga is just by my very being. I, I try to be an example. My Instagram, which is really our main way of communicating, so I'm referencing it. It's like my vision board. The things that I love, the things that I am, the things that I'm working on, things that I aspire toward, whether be they products, technologies, or otherwise. That's what I have for you all I've got. The oils are in my hair, my face, my mouth, my life, my body all the time. I share them as a matter of course. I don't think too hard about it. Fragmented toxicity. Well, if you've ever been socially shamed, which I have, Exact for my business, actually, which is really cute. Um, if you've ever been in the middle of a real debate on political leanings, on conspiracies, you know, 
all of that is fragmented toxicity. It's okay to have your opinion. It's not okay to foist it on a bunch of other people and deny them access if they don't agree. That's a form of fragmented toxicity. So yes, there are times when people have treated me so, so, so poorly. Wow, unbelievable. Just jealousy, fear, fragmented toxicity. And I look at it as if from a distance with a lot of curiosity and a lot of compassion. And I can see where it came from. Almost instantly, I can see, you know, okay, so that person had this happen to them at some stage in their life, which makes it accessible to them to even want to then perpetrate it on me. I have now compassion for that. Dr. Edith was saying today, she, she, unbelievably, she actually had a personal meeting with Dr. Joseph Mengele, one of the biggest criminals of ever in history. And this was just after he had sent her mother to die. And he said, dance for me. And she did. She danced for this, this, this monster. And in the middle of this dance, she realized that he was more pitiful than her. He was more pitiable than her in that moment. And her curiosity saved her life. She did this thing and she was spared. Now I'm not compare, comparing social shaming to what she endured. But what I am pointing out is the willingness to be curious and compassionate in the face of fragmented toxicity and utter chaos really around you or within you, that will prolong your happiness. And that will make you a better teacher, a better leader, a better parent, better child. In addition to offering ourselves empathy, Bonnie is asking, how would you suggest starting to offer this generosity toward ourselves? I think that I have a tendency to offer this generosity to other people. Much room for improvement with mudita. Yes, yeah, sympathetic joy, very, very good. But neglect this generosity with myself. So this is the kind of, I, I referenced this early on in the talk, a consistent practice of you know, when I have these times, I'll speak for myself. I, you know, in these times when I'm moving through my day and all of a sudden I feel like I'm having atrial fibrillation and I'm like, oh my God, I got to do this and I, I got to do that. And then I got to do this. And I'm like saying things out loud, even to, to make sure that I remember all the things that I intend to do. I have to rest. Can you actually get out your calendar right now while I'm speaking, pull your calendar up and put in a 20 minute rest period somewhere in each day that repeats. Repeat each day, 20 minutes. Like don't tear yourself asunder. Keep this appointment. Mine is coming right after this. 5.30 every day is my appointment. I sit and sometimes I lie down, 20 minutes. I set an alarm. My entire body goes into full healing mode. That's how Bonnie in this day and age, as ridiculous as this sounds, schedule it because <laughs> it will happen if it's in your schedule. Same way you respect a phone call with your dear friend. Any other questions before we close?
All right. I just want to say thank you, Elena. Thank you so much. It's been, yeah, so incredible. I, I don't have words. I'm just grateful. Thank you. Woman, you made my day. You made my week. I uh, want to thank everybody who stuck around with me. Thank you so very, very, very much for being here. I look forward to sharing more time with you in the future. I will be uh, teaching weekly soon. I cannot wait. And Katie, I love you. I'm very, very proud of you. I consider you a peer. I don't consider you a student. And I'm just so proud of what you've created here. Thank you for doing this.